<laughs> Genesis chapter 3. Anyway, praise the Lord. Good day, but keep praying for everybody. Some of you are young, too. You got a lot of years to go, man. <laughs> There's going to be like 60 kids in here. <laughs> Genesis chapter 3, verse number 23. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So let's pray. Father, Lord, we pray you be with us now. Help us as we examine this and continue on with this subject, Lord. Uh, give grace, give wisdom, give guidance. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So we understand that God sent man forth and he sent him to work. He sent him out of the garden. Even before, uh, before that, work was not a punishment. Work was what men did. And uh, God made man for that reason. Uh, but after the fall of man, it says that the, that God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So that was the, the there was a punishment, the flaming sword. Uh, there was punishment for man and woman uh, for their sin and what they had did. But what uh, what they had done? What about the woman? The home was her focus. The Bible said that she would be saved. What in childbearing? Right. That's where her salvation comes from in that sense. Not, we're not talking about eternal life when we say that. We're talking about her sanctification. Her uh, God promises that he will care for them, that he will take care of them when they are in the place that God wants them to be doing what God wants them to do, that God is going to take care of you. The home was to be her focus. That's when you notice the judgments that were meted out. It said nothing about Eve. Uh, for what you've done, you're going to go till the ground. And you're going to go, uh, you know, and the ground shall not bring forth in thorns and thistles. No, that's not what the command was given. God made them both differently, and then it, their judgments were different. And that didn't change. Uh, th that hasn't changed. It's the same today. No instructions were given for her in the workforce. She was never meant to be there. God never made woman to be out in the world. He never made her for that purpose. He made her to be a helpmeet to who? To Adam. Right. She is not to, she was not to be something else. She was not to go off and try to make a career and make a life and, 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 and gain an identity out in the world. But evolution has taught differently, hasn't it? Satan taught differently from the garden. Yea, hath God said, and ye shall be as gods. Come on, Eve, you can do what you want. You can make your own decisions. That hasn't worked well, has it? 6,000 years and it's still working bad, right? is isn't working out well. Many of the things changed the order that God had laid down for our society and, and for the home. Now, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But God laid down the order of his creation. Men and women did not even work together, nor were they intended to. If you look in the Bible, you don't see a lot. I'm going to show you a story of where they did and show you the differences in the things that God had placed down. But God laid down the order of his creation. And men and women, they didn't even, they weren't together. Only in the last 150 to 200 years have we seen in the last, in the end of the 19th century, 20th century, and on in, have we seen this, this merging of women into society away from the home. These professional women, these career women, and all, we, we didn't see that before in civilizations. It wasn't, it wasn't God's way. God never had it that way. Why? We don't see it in the Bible. It wasn't taught and instructed in the Bible because God never wanted it to be that way. God never, he never ordained it to be that way. But I, I'll submit to you that it is the feminization of man, and that's the whole purpose. It is to feminize man. It is it is to change him. It is to make him effeminate. It is to impact him and their influence to impact him. Then in comes these the cross-sex relationships that started over the last 150, 200 years. Let's look, let's look at the book of Ruth. Let's go there, will we? Shall we? Let's go. Flip through your pages here, and let's go to Ruth. All right, the story of Ruth and Boaz. Because we do see a woman that has to work here. 
I want to, I, you know, I want to talk to you a little bit about that. Because we do see in the Word of God that there are times and there are situations where a woman does have to work. Now, if you ask me, what is God's perfect order? God's perfect order is for a a, a daughter or a wife to be home with her husband or her father and to be cared for and to guide the home and to raise children and everything that Titus chapter 2 tells you that she's supposed to do. Right? Right? I believe that. I still believe God's word. I still believe the reason. And by the way, when you see ladies and you see the judgment, listen, we are still seeing women rebel and men rebelling against God's judgment that he gave in the Garden of Eden. God said, lady, you'll be saved in that childbearing. In sorrow, you'll bring forth and you'll conceive. And, and, and this and your, your, um, your husband will rule over you, but you're going to be submissive to a sinner and he's going to make mistakes. He's not going to be perfect. Right? What do we see today? A rebellion to that. Still a rebellion to that. Man sending his wife off to, to make the money to all this stuff. It's a rebellion to God's order. It's, it's just simple rebellion is all that it is. And then the woman running out and career women and everything else. What is that? It's rebellion. It's just all it is is rebellion. It's rebellion to the order that God laid down. God said, these are the judgments. This is the way that it's going to be. This is what I have commanded. He set the order up before that. And then he said, this is what's going to happen to you. We see the story of Ruth here. Ruth and Boaz, right? What a beautiful story, right? But at the beginning of it, it's not very sweet, is it? In that sense, Naomi says it's what? Bitter. Call me bitter. What happened? She followed her husband? Uh, it, to Moab, and he died. Her two, he died. Her two, her two sons died. Right, and she was left alone. Her daughter-in-law was there, Ruth, and Ruth came with her. Right, so R- Ruth said, "Okay, I'll, I'll cleave unto you, and I'll go with you. Where you go, I'll go. Where you die, I'll die, and your God will be my God." Right. So Ruth goes with Naomi. Now, what is the situation here going on? Well, Naomi is an older woman. They have no they have no man to take care of them. They have no money. They have nothing. So Ruth is young, and she's able to go to a field and go to glean and get some food to survive. Now, the goal of that was to the field that she ended up with and where she ended up with was God's providence that she would go glean at Boaz's field, who is the next of kinsmen. So we do see there are times when a woman doesn't have a husband or a father to take care of them. They don't follow the Lord. They're not going to. And the, and the, the woman is forced to go to work. We understand that. There's, there's single ladies. There's problems that those things happen. That happens. But you have to be faithful to the Lord and continue on. So we see that she's gleaning in the field. In Ruth chapter 2, verse number 8 and 9, We find the story here. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter? Go not to glean in another field. Neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. I thought it was interesting that Boaz notices this young lady, and he says, you know what? You need to go over with the women. You need to be careful. You need to stick around those women. Look what he says here. Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? Why did he do that? Because what happens when men and women get together like that in a field and anywhere like that? Right? That something could happen. And he knew it. Right? That's not an, it's not a normal workplace. It's not normally how things went. Let thine eyes be on the field, he said. Uh, that they do reap, and go thou after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? And when thou art athirst, thirst, go unto the vessels, and drink of that which the young men have drawn. So he was caring for her. And he said, you know, stay by the maidens. Why? Well, they were safer when they were together. It wasn't really safe for a young lady to be around a bunch of men. Young men. Right? That's why the dumbest invention of modern churches is the youth department. The absolute dumbest invention in all of fundamentalism. Well, maybe one of them. I'd have to keep thinking. I'd probably think of others. But one of the dumbest ones. Why is that? 
You throw a bunch of uh, uh, of of young boys and girls together that are balls of hormones, and you throw them together, right? And you bring them all together, and you put them all together, and you let them go hang out with each other. All night events, lock ins, all kinds of different things like that. That's dumb. And you know what's even dumber? Putting them with a 22-year-old youth pastor. Boy, that takes a lot of brains, don't it? I know I never went to Bible college, so it didn't get to make me that stupid. But I knew before I ever went, I ever stepped into that, that's the dumbest thing you could ever do. Whose idea was this? The devils. That's who. Look. We know there ought to be limited times where our children hang around each other, right? Why do we know that? Because there's a lot of foolishness in them, that's why. And the more that, the more that they spend time together, the more foolish they can get, unless there's a rod that comes down and says, no, I think you're done with that. So then you put them all together, and you have them playing together, and running around together, and talking together, and everything else. And what's going to end up happening? Well, you already know what's going to end up happening. Just what Boaz knew was going to happen. That's why Boaz is like, go stand fast by the maidens. Right? And I told the young men not to touch you. Yeah, he had to tell them. Leave her alone. 15 and 16. Is this too straight today for, for today? Is it is it just too straight? It's like, you know, it's like they told that old prophet Elijah, hey, it's too straight here, they told Elijah. It's just too straight here. Let's go somewhere else. You know, that's that's the problem. This type of preaching is just too straight. Well, it takes all their fun out. That sanctioned foolishness. Then you can't, you can't, like... Right, exactly. Like you got to come to church and you got to turn it into that kind of fun. That's not fun. It's insanity. You're asking for trouble, and I've seen it, and they got it. And when she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, "Let her glean even among the sheaves, and reproach her not, and let fall also some of the handfuls of purpose for her, and leave them, that she may glean them." And rebuke her not. Why'd he do that for her? Because she's a female. <laughs> and she she wasn't she, she he made it easy for her. Why? Because she wasn't a man. She was a lady, and they're not equal. <gasps> right? No. I mean that makes sense, right? Like you all get that. I mean, I know we in this room understand that, but they're, they're not equal. And I, I, I'm not even going to have time to talk about a lot of things that we could talk about, like like tranny boys going over to girls' sports and dominating girls' sports. Well, there's the result of effeminate men. Feminizing men, right? Some girl recently got in trouble because because she didn't want some boy in her in, in in the shower at school. Yeah, she got in trouble for it. Because I guess, see, I, I, I wouldn't do anything to the boy as much as I'd go look for his dad, his dad if he had one, and be like, we're going to talk. I know. We, we shouldn't be real men, right? <laughs> you can't think like that. Come on. you Judge. <laughs> I want to show you some of the research. This is from an article from The Art of Manliness, but honestly, this was an article that went across the board. 
it went everywhere. It was a giant study that was done in cross-sex relationships and everything else. Uh, there was another one by a university. There's two of them. I might be getting them confused, but there's a couple of them that they did. And I think it's important because you're going to understand the differences here. In one study, researchers at the University of Wisconsin, this okay, they brought together 88 pairs of cross-sex friends. That means boys that are friends with girls. Now, I, I'm talking about men, not boys, not like children, okay? Men. Men that are friends with women. Now, I, I want to I want to stop for a second and just speak very plainly to you, as if I haven't been already. Let me be very clear to you, okay? All right. So yes, I consider like all the ladies in this room sisters in Christ, and in that way they are we are we are all friends in that way, right? But there's an appropriateness to that friendship in that way, correct? Which means that like. I honestly have no desire to go hang out with some woman that's not my wife, my mother, or my daughters, right? And even if I did, it'd be wrong. Thank you. It, it would it would be wrong. Why would it be wrong? Well, first of all, I don't know why any guy would want to. No offense, all right? I, I'm not trying to be mean, but I, like, don't see how you, like, okay, I want to tell you, I grew up. Now, maybe the 20-year-old dude year old dudes are different. I don't know. But when I was young, like, and I'm not being perverted. I'm not. I'm not being improper, and I'm not going to be. I'm just telling you, I only had one reason to hang around girls. See, so you're a pig. No, I'm a man. And albeit I wasn't, I didn't do right because... Of course, that's in a man, but he do, he controls that if he and and he does right, he doesn't do that. But my point is that like, I don't know how you like. Oh, I'm just gonna go hang out with this girl. Like for what? Like the only reason I hung out with a girl was to hang out with a girl. Right. I mean, do, do 20-year-olds still think that way, or is it different now? Is it like, do they just like hanging out with girls, like, for the sake of just, oh, I have a friend that's a girl? Like, do people still do that, or are they still, are they, are men still men that really think that way? Right? Or I hung out with a girl because she had a pretty friend, and I wanted to hang out with that girl. Right? Am, am I, am I telling the truth? I mean, honestly, I'm like, come on, somebody be a man. Will somebody say yes here? I just want to know, all right? Now, if you grew up Christian, great, you didn't do any of it. God bless you. That's the way it's supposed to go. I'm just telling you, if any of our children were allowed to do the things the world does, that would be the natural tendency. It wouldn't be like, hey, I'm just going to go, like, hang out with this girl. Like, yeah, yeah, fellowshipping. Yeah, yeah. If some guy walked up to my daughter and said, I, I just want to fellowship with your daughter, I was like, you're going to fellowship with my fist. You can fellowship with my foot. How about some fellowship with my knee to your face? Would you like some of that? How about some fellowship with my elbow? I'll give you some of that. Right? That's what I would think if you told me that. No, I mean, seriously, just hang out. Yeah, I already knew what I did when I just hung out with girls, and it wasn't anything good. Right? So guess what? It doesn't work. And it's really a way to effeminize men in this workplace. I'm going to show you why. Anyway, 88 pairs of cross-sex friends into a lab. The pairs were required to promise in front of each other they would refrain from discussing the study after they left the lab. They were then separated and asked a series of questions to gauge their romantic feelings towards their opposite sex friends. Researchers found that while women were generally not attracted to their male friends, and saw their relationship as strictly platonic. Now, in some ways, I believe that. Because there's some women that they're like, oh, I can just be around people and not, like, think that way. I know, but I want to help you. Guys don't think that way. Guys don't think that way. Most guys don't think that way. Heterosexual guys don't think that way. Right, Zach? <laughs> right, Scott? <laughs> They don't think that way. Oh, I think I'll just go out and have some tea with this woman. And that's, I just, we're just going to be friends. Like I am, like one of the dudes. <laughs> yeah, we're just bonding. No, it's 
like that lady, that preacher Jezebel lady that offered to ask me to go for coffee with her. We should go for coffee sometime. You asked the wrong preacher that. I thought that's weird. Like, the only reason I ever went out with a girl was a dater. I didn't go out, like, just to be friends with her. Like, because I saw her as the opposite sex. I saw her gender. I couldn't erase her gender from my mind. Like, I never forget, honestly, and I'm not, I'm not speaking wickedly or like that, but I never forget that you ladies in this room are ladies. I mean, sometimes I do when I say things that maybe might make you mad, but, but, <laughs> but, or how you react to it. But the point is that I still understand you're a woman, right? So, like, what I say to Aaron is not what I would say to Rachel, right? I, I wouldn't say this, I wouldn't have the same conversation, right? What I say to Lee is not what I would say in front of his wife, okay? We would have a different conversation. Yeah, so there's things I've said to them that I haven't said to you. Now, go wonder about that. But anyway, <laughs> that's, that's torture for a woman right there, what I just said. That's like, you're going to be sitting there, what did he say? You'll never know. They're sworn to secrecy. Anyway, what's that? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Amnon had a friend. Yeah. You mean Amnon? Amnon, yeah. Go listen to that sermon by Larry Brown. Isn't it Amnon had a friend? Whew. You just have to have a southern accent when you preach that kind of message. It's great, and you got to bash TVs. It's so awesome. Researchers found that while women were generally not... So the women, like, they... Yeah, sometimes they don't really think like that, like, as much. Like, what you think they're thinking is not what they're thinking. Researchers found that while women were generally not attracted to their male friends and saw the relationship as strictly platonic, the men usually had romantic feelings for their lady friends. Not only were the, guy, not only were the guys more attracted to their supposedly platonic female buddies... They also mistakenly believed that the feelings were reciprocal, and they were more willing to act on their erroneously perceived mutual attractions. What am I saying? You, yeah, you set up the stalker mentality. Oh, you don't really like me? Right. That's why, ladies, you're not supposed to give your attention to other men. Online or in person. You're not supposed to. Why? Because a guy has, like, these weird antennas that go off okay and they think there's something there even if there isn't anything there do you understand that's how men are right that's how men are they, they they have these little antennas that go off and they think something's there even if it's not there right and the woman is thinking like 90 miles in the other direction like not even close you weirdo right what's the matter with you creep right that's but that's but men think totally different. They can't do that. And if they can, it's kind of cuz they're effeminate. Because real men stay away from situations that they know are very bad. That can get them into trouble or have potential trouble. They're like Joseph and they get up and they run out of the house. <laughs> Wherever they're at. Get them out of here. I've been at bookstores before and women have creeped me out. I'm like, okay, I'm gone. And I just like, <laughs> just like left and called my wife. I was like, okay, that was weird. <laughs> and just got out of there. Why? Because it was weird. It's just, I, I, I knew something was, wasn't right. And I'm like, I'm out of here. This study suggests that women generally think that guys and gals can just be friends while men are secretly hoping there's a chance their relationship with their female friends can be something more. Basically, this study gives us a scientific explanation for the friend zone. <laughs> Women and men are often on completely different wavelengths when it comes to their cross-sex relationships because they're not supposed to have them. It, it is confusion. That's what Satan wants. Utter confusion. That's why we limit our contact in such cases. Okay, so this lady comments about the same article, and I want to read you this because it's... I think she is a Jezebel, but she says, now maybe I'm just a garden variety Jezebel, what I, which I would say, yes, I believe you are. Really? Glad you admitted it. Thank you. She said, but I, a single woman, often spend time alone with married men in the course of my work. 
just the fact that she brags about it makes me want to go punch monkeys. I mean, it just it, it just it bothers me that she brags about that. Right? Right? Does that bother you that she like brags about that? Look, I spend time with married men all the time. I buy them coffee. I take them out to lunch. Sometimes, temptress that I am, I even drink wine with them at dinner. Well, you ho. Often when I'm, uh, when I'm downtown, I will beckon a married male colleague into my office. I have so many to choose from. Do you see how she's mocking? We say nothing until I close the door. We sit down, we look straight into each other's eyes, and then we talk about work. Now, I don't believe her. I think she's lying, too. In 2015, National Journal conducted an anonymous survey asking women about their experiences as congressional staffers. We're going to get into a little bit into politics here because this is along the same lines as this article. Were there any advantages to being a woman? Had they ever experienced sexism? Advantages were mostly superficial, according to the responses. One woman said she was treated better by security guards than her male colleagues. Well, that makes sense because they were afraid for her. Right? They, they felt protective because men, that's the natural tendency of a man is to feel protective. They want to push that out of us, right? But they, they want to. Another said the Republican congressman seemed to like to have women as spokespeople. Brutes. But the disadvantages were stark, part, particularly when it came to issues like being alone with the, their male bosses. There's a great deal of favoritism in my office, the woman. The women work the hardest, and the men get all the benefits. The high-profile trips with my boss, greater access to the White House, and privileged, prestigious contacts. It's a boys' club, and the women are rarely invited. You know why? You know why they're doing that? Because they know they're gonna, these men know they're going to get set up. They know that if they take, and I'm going to get into it, the big setup. But they know that if they spend time with these women... Listen to me. All these women have to do is lie about them. It doesn't have to be the truth. Do you understand that? And we live in a society today that's where you automatically believe the accuser. So you automatically believe Satan, the old accuser? <laughs> Most people do, yes. Mike Pence. Mike Pence, the vice president, won't dine alone with a woman who's not his wife. I, I actually respect that man for that stand. I absolutely respect him. You know why? Because at least he holds to his convictions and he can't be accused of one of those me too moments. Right? He says, no, I'm not going to go out to dinner with any. And, and, and people are flying out against him. They're mad. They're like calling him, you know. Uh, she says, there's a great deal of favoritism in my office. The women work the hardest. So we, we looked at that. Now, in, the, in her 2016 book, Sex in the Office, Ellister coined the phrase, a sex partition. She's talking about the sexes the, to describe this dynamic. It's an artificial barrier between men and women at work. She said male subordinates who can spend time alone with their bosses are going to develop deeper relationships. Why? Because men can talk together. Men develop, they develop a friendship together. Obviously says LSR when it, when it comes time for promotions, who's going to get them? The men. And I say, good. I say good. Go home and make some cookies and brownies and ice cream if you want. Homemade I, chocolate and pizza. Why is that? Why, why would that offend a woman? I would, think, I would think a lady would say, sure, I'll make some good ones. Right? You'd think, wouldn't you? I would think so. If you told Joshua to go chop some wood, he'd be like, okay, I will then. And I'll make it a good tree. Right? Anyway, while we've been engaged in discussion about whether it's appropriate for men to avoid being alone with their female colleagues and subordinates, we've also been awash in new tales of bad male behavior over at the Fox News Network. We've heard about these things, right? Last week in the New York Times published a front page investigation to harassment allegations. This was a year or two ago, allegations against Fox star Bill O'Reilly reported that five women had reached settlements totaling $13 million with the network or, or O'Reilly personally. At least two of the network settlements, the Times reported, were reached after Fox removed longtime chairman Roger Ailes 
in the wake of sexual harassment claims by two dozen women. Now, you you remember that Megyn Kelly accused Roger Ailes of that, and then she got some kind of settlement, that, or she moved over to CBS News and, and or NBC News or something, and now she's gone. Why? Because she ruined her name because nobody wanted anything to do with her anymore. Because nobody trusts her. Would you want to be around her? <clears throat> now, if you're he, this guy goes on to talk about the relationship between male and female. I don't agree with what he says here. He says, well, if you're older and you can get away with it and things like that. And um, he says, if you're older, you, you may be able to have, you know, female friends or whatever and such like that. But be careful that your wife doesn't get jealous and all that kind of stuff. Well, first of all, why would I even have? What's the point? Yeah, why would you give your wife a reason to be jealous? He said, but he did go on to say, though, in this article, uh, he goes on to talk about the fact that he said, you know, a lot of these people, he said him and his wife have met people that did do that. He doesn't, I don't think personally, but he said he has met people that did do that, have friends and all that before. And he said that they they would go out with them and uh, like the, hus- the, the wife or the husband or whatever would go out with a female friend and they would go out for tea or something or coffee or something, whatever, right? And that they could handle it and then nothing was going to happen. But he said they saw marriages crumble because it did happen. Right, exactly, exactly. One of the, one, this lady says, Kim Ellis, or the same lady says, if you don't go out to dinner with a woman, it's hard to have a woman be your campaign manager, your chief of staff. I believe this is gender discrimination. Well, let me stop there and say that she's right, but God discriminates. God discriminates. There is just such a thing as discrimination. It's called judgment. It's called being wise. It's called looking at things and saying, you know what? I'm not going to go down that road. I'm going to tell you what this is all for, though. She said, how does this feminize men? Because men aren't going to know what to do. There are so many men in the workforce today that are scared to death of women. Because they're scared they're going to be lied about and, they're gonna, and, and, and that they're going to they're gonna be accused of something. They're absolutely scared to death of it. Everywhere they go, they're scared of it. Here's another thing that feminizes men. Feminizes men, that's female bosses. I'm going to talk about this because this, this, isn't, this isn't always popular. Now, some of you may have had female bosses, or maybe you do have female bosses. I'm just telling you, God never meant a, a, a female to be a boss and to order men around. God never meant that to be that way. You might have a nice one and a good one that's, that's good or whatever, but I'm going to tell you something right now. That isn't, what God me- that isn't how God meant it to be. And for a woman to order around a man or direct a man or lead a man is wrong. God never meant it to be that way. And when you see it, you get, I, okay, first of all, like, I couldn't do it. I'm just, I'm, it didn't work out for me very well. I had bosses like that in different jobs that I had, and I usually quit them, like, the next day just because, like, I couldn't take it. Like, I always had a problem with Jezebel women anyway. They always kind of just, like, made my skin crawl. Like, I would always get mad, and I'm like, there's, like, testosterone that would just rise up in me, and I would just be like this this testosterone beast that would be like, okay, I'm, I'm, I got to get out of here because I'm going to just, like, devour this lady if I don't get out of here because she's driving me nuts. And I, I couldn't do it. Why? Because I'm a man, and I don't, I don't like it. I don't like a woman telling me what to do. I just don't. This article, fizz.org, it says this. Men may feel more threatened by female bosses, research finds. Well, duh. Duh. Think about it. If God made men to lead and says men are to rule, you don't think at all that's not going to have an that's not going to have an effect on a man when a woman is telling him what to do and ordering him around and directing him? You don't think that's going to have an effect on him? Of course it is. Why? Because it's against the way God made him. God never made him to be submissive to a woman. He made a woman to be submissive to a man. Men may feel threatened by female supervisors and act more assertively towards them than male bosses, which could disrupt the workplace with struggles over power dynamics, according to new research published in Personality and Social Psychology Bulletin. Well, of course. He feels threatened, so he pushes back. I mean, that's what men do. That's how they react. The concept of masculinity 
<laughs> Here it is. The concept of masculinity is becoming more elusive in society as gender roles blur. So it's taken like 50 years for people to admit that the gender roles are blurring, but not a peep out of it, out of fundamentalism. Go scour sermon audio. Go scour all your, your Baptist churches in the area. Scour all of them and see how many sermons you have on this subject. Not very many. Why? Because they're afraid. And their churches have big offerings from women going to work and making 40, 50 bucks an hour. They like them. See, I don't like it. And I don't like it because it gives them an attitude. They get bossy. Because when you give them that authority and you put them in that place, it makes them bossy. So they say that in society, gender roles blur with more women taking management positions and becoming major breadwinners for their families. Said lead researcher, Ekater... Tenaria, whatever her last name is, an assistant professor of management and technology at Bocini University of Milan, Italy. Even men who support gender equality may see these advances as a threat to their masculinity, whether they consciously acknowledge it or not. Well, I, I'm going to tell you, I consciously acknowledge it. And it's not a threat to my masculinity. It's an attack on it. It's an attack on it. That's what it is. And I, I do not support gender equality. I reject gender equality. I need a banner that I reject gender equality. Zach needs a banner that he rejects gender equality. Zach needs his future wife to know that he rejects gender equality. Your future wife is listening right now, Zach. She's going to love it, and I guarantee it. <laughs> okay, listen now. <laughs> She'll never come back again. In an experiment with 76 college students, 52 male, 24 female. Why has it got to be double? What's up with that? At a, as a, at a uni, U.S. university, participants were told they would negotiate their salary at a new job in a computer exercise with a male or female hiring manager. After the negotiation, participants took an implicit threat test where they guessed words that appeared on a computer screen for a fraction of a second. Participants who, cho who chose more threat-related words included fear or risk were judged to feel more threatened. Male participants who negotiated with the female manager exhibited more threat and pushed for a higher salary, 49400 average, compared to men negotiating with a male manager, 49870 now, I can believe this because the man is feeling challenged. He's like, okay, so because of the nature of the of a woman that's good, that's that's kind of ruling over him that way, so he's going to exert some power. Makes sense. But when a man is leading another man, there's a difference. There's a difference. The manager's gender didn't affect female participants. Well, of course not, because they're women who negotiated for a lower salary of forty one thousand three hundred forty six average. Reflecting a common trend where women tend to be less aggressive than men in negotiations. Makes sense. By their nature. In another experiment, 68 male college students had to decide how to split a $10,000 bonus with a male or female team member or supervisor. Male participants evenly split the money with male or female team members, but men felt more threatened by a female supervisor and tried to keep more money for themselves than with a, than, than with a male supervisor. Self-assertive behavior by men towards female bosses could disrupt the, disrupt the workplace dynamics, stifle team cohesiveness, and negatively affect team performance. In an ideal world, men and organizations would be concerned by these finding, findings and adjust their behavior accordingly. But if they don't, where does that leave women? How about home? That'd be a good place. Home. Sounds like a good place to me. Given the strong societal norms surrounding masculinity. See how they hate that when they say, given the strong societal norms surrounding masculinity. Yeah, because you can't have a society without masculinity. And by the way, those Jezebels know that too. So they try to fake masculinity, 
but they know you need it. It may be difficult for men to recognize or change their behavior. So what are they wanting? They want men to stop being men and to be feminine. That's what they want. That's what they want men to do. They're setting it up. They pushed women in this workforce. They've pushed her there, and they want to blur the, the, the gender. He's, she said it. They blurred the gender roles, and they want to blur them together and steal the masculinity of a man and make him feminine. So just have a woman rule over him and tell him what to do. That'll do it. I, look, I see it all the time. I see it on the street all the time. Men and women come up, and the women are the ones that are yelling at us, and the men are standing there holding the lady's purse while they're yelling at us. And I just look at him like, why don't you talk? I remember this one. I looked at her, and I go, I don't want to talk to you. I want to talk to your husband. You misogynist. That's what she called me. And her gay friends probably got mad too or whatever. Remember all those, remember that? They were all like, well, whatever. They're probably all fruits. But if men won't change their actions and female supervisors may want to appear more proactive and less power seeking to maintain smooth relationships in the workplace. So they got to go covert with their, with their operation there. What is all this? It's the judgment of God. Isaiah 3.12, as for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. Hey, can we stop for a second and realize this isn't a good thing? Like, can, I, can I help? Like, this isn't a good thing. Can, can we slow down a minute and just look at this? As for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. What does the last line say? Oh, my people, they which lead thee, Cause thee to err and destroy the ways of thy paths. Err causes them to fall, leads them astray. So women in leadership, women ruling over them, causes them to stray from the truth. Did it not happen in, in, the, in the garden? Still happening today. Here's why. It's a judgment because men don't want to man up. Take care of their family, keep the women at home, raising babies. They want to put them in the workforce. And God says, well, I'll let them steal your masculinity then. And that's what's happening. Masculinity is being taken. It's being taken from them. We're seeing it. We've accepted a lot of things. Here's some hot button issues that are fun to talk about. Female bosses. They've been accepted, right? Female soldiers. We're going to talk about that next week, probably. And then one of the most annoying things I've ever seen in my life is female politicians. I just want to get on a loudspeaker and read John, John Knox's uh, treaties against women in authority out in public and see if I get killed. But <laughs> from my underground bunker, maybe, with a loudspeaker. Where's that coming from? We have no idea. But female politicians, right? I mean, come on. Every day you go on, it's not men dealing with men. It's like the Speaker of the House is a woman. And the president is constantly surrounded by women. Yeah. And then, and then look and understand this, too. That he's also surrounded by sodomites. Then on the Republican national ticket, Peter Thiel, the sodomite, was right up on front and Trump was clapping for him and made, made it a point to let you all know that all you Republican evangelicals just accepted a homosexual on stage at the Republican national convention. Ha ha, dummies. America. And who do they get mad at? The guy that tells them, you guys did it. All these pro-Trump guys, but they don't want to acknowledge these things and call these, because there's other things that are more important than that, right? Female politicians, female athletes, female pastors.
right? Do you realize that historically what men have always done has been replaced by women? Does that bother you at all? I'm just curious. Does that bother you at all that that's being done? Now, it should bother men, and it should bother women. That ought to make you say, you know what, that's terrible. But I, but I think that we've been so ingrained with all these things that when I say this, you probably think, you probably think I'm taking it too far. Like, maybe you're just being too nitpicky, Pastor. Maybe you're just being, if you would just be a little less bold about those issues, and you would just, you know, say it a little bit nicer, and maybe soft sell a little bit, then maybe all those ladies wouldn't hate you. And maybe the feminists wouldn't be mad. But I'm sorry, I don't believe that's the case. I don't think Naboth said it too mean when Jezebel had him killed. All he said was, God forbid that I should sell you my vineyard, I'll kill him. Kill him dead. Right? Kill him dead. All of these things have been replaced. So where are the men? Let me ask you, where is the American man in this? Ah, here on this side, we have the two scariest women alive. Nancy Pelosi and Maxine Waters. A couple of the scariest women alive. Hillary's not in there. Right here, we have a female soldier at the top, which looks completely unnatural. And at the bottom, we have Beth Moore, the preacher woman that's taken the Southern Baptist Convention by a storm and preaching in their churches. Now, overturning. Did anybody listen to that two-hour uh, thing I did on feminism I, and, the, and the Southern Baptist slide? Did anybody listen to that? Okay. I covered that. By the way, that book that I reviewed with you guys, Feminism by J.W. Porter, that book right there was an exact treatise against what's going on right now in the Southern Baptist Convention. And it was 150 years ago that, that was written, 130 years ago that was written. And they were warning after, right after the women's suffrage movement, during the women's suffrage movement and after, they were warning about it and they were backing down that Jezebel spirit out of their churches. By playing with status and gender, the researchers were able to show that status alone isn't enough to make men feel threatened and assert themselves. It's gender plus status that jeopardizes their manhood and causes them to be more pushy with women in the workplace. See, they don't like being told what to do by a woman. Right? Makes sense, doesn't it? Now, that's like cuss words if you'd say that out in public right now. And I would love to say it at when one of the biggest Baptist churches in Minnesota and just see how they'd look at me. Matter of fact, any of the Baptist churches in Minnesota, I'd like to say it. How would they look? How would they react? Could the pastor support that? You know, these guys lost the gender wars a long time ago. Because they gave him up. This is the judgment of God. It's gender plus status that jeopardizes their manhood and causes them to be more pushy with women. They don't like a woman telling them what to do, so they exert their manhood. That's what men do. You're asking them to be feminine and not be a man. And they're not... Look... They're not going to be like a female version of you. Clearly, this is a problematic for the, main, for, for the many talented, determined women trying to break through the glass ceiling or simply earn a living. So is the fix for women to pretend they're not ambitious? No, it's to go home. Uh, to focus on the team and never themselves? No, it's to go home. No, let these findings serve as an impetus to work even harder in the face of aggression. After all, if men are truly questioning their manhood just because they're reporting to a woman, who are the weak ones here? See, that, that makes me mad. I read that and it makes me think of this. That's what it makes me think of. You know, Jez that Jezebel spirit is alive and well today. 
and it's pervasive everywhere. It has perv- it, it has infiltrated every aspect of life. And all it is is direct rebellion to God. And God said he was going to deal with it in Revelation chapter 2.20. Someday he's going to put that spirit down. And it will go down. But that's exactly what that is. The way she said, why not accept God's order and do what's right? Now, we, can't ex- we cannot expect the world's going to do that. We can't expect God's people to do it. What do you think would happen if these type of messages in dealing with these things were preached in churches all over the country? A lot more children. Probably lose some church members. Right? Smaller churches, but people would get right with God. People that wanted to follow the Lord would. You know, people are looking for, they have preachers come in and talk about revival. Right? They have, they, they have all these, they talk about revival, but they won't touch on the things that, the fundamentals. Right, it would. When you get the family right, when you get the order of the sexes right, when you get dad right and you get mom right, and then you get then you, the families right, guess what? The church gets right. When the church gets right, this nation gets right. But how can we expect it to be that way? That's also what I think of. That's that's Samuel. He's he not your Samuel, but yeah, Hugh and Agag to pieces. Yeah, it's kind of. <laughs> Let's talk about the Me Too movement, which makes me want to do what I just saw there. <laughs> anyway, how does this affect a man? Well, all these accusations against men have literally feminized man because they're afraid to do anything. They don't know how to react. They don't know what to do in the workplace. They don't know how to deal with women. More men are uncomfortable interacting with women at work since the Me Too study says. It's May 17, 2019. More men, they're like, they're uncomfortable. They don't even want to be around women. They're just like super uncomfortable around them. Why? Because they're afraid they're going to get accused of something. Because all they have to do to lose, their, to, to lose something is just be accused. They don't even have to be guilty of it. They just have to be accused of it. Women are still navigating the effects of the male-dominated workplaces a year and a half after the rise of the Me Too movement. A new study by LeanIn.org found 60% of male managers said they are uncomfortable interacting with women at work, up 32% from 2018. 60% of men are uncomfortable just to be around them. Workplace interactions that men are nervous about include mentoring, socializing, and having one-on-one meetings. See, some of these guys are forced to do that in the jobs that they're in. They're forced to. Lean In's founder and Facebook's, Facebook's chief operating officer said on CBS this morning, on Friday, the survey results indicate we're in a bad place. Well, I would say so. 60% of male managers in the U.S. are afraid to have a one-on-one meeting with a woman? Sandberg said, to which Gail King immediately asked, how do you get promoted without a one-on-one meeting? Probably don't. But when they started this Me Too man-hating movement, and it spread across, what do you think the effects of men are going to be? They're going to want to stay as far away from everything they can. Exactly Sandberg's point. She went on to explain that senior men who were surveyed, are also nine times more likely to hesitate to travel with a woman and six times more likely to hesitate to have a work dinner. Good, they shouldn't anyway. The problem is that even before this, women, and especially women of color, do not get the same amount of mentoring as men, which means we're not getting an equal seat at the table. Good. And you know it's not enough to not harass us. You need to negotiate. You need not ignore us either. See what they're doing to men? Oh, listen, listen, man, we're going to tell you what to do. You're not going to act like a man and lead us. You're just going to teach us what we need to know. And you're going to do what you're told to do. And you're going to treat us. You can't ignore us and you can't uh, flirt with us and you can't do all these other things, which I'm not condoning flirting with women. But the point is that what they're saying is you, you have to interact with us. You have to do everything we say. Yeah. Otherwise, otherwise, you're going to be in trouble. 
Yeah. That's right. If men don't, women will. Sandberg called men's fears of a false trade-off and pointed out that many of the scenarios they are concerned about can happen in public spaces. If there's a man out there who doesn't want to have a work dinner with a woman, my message is simple. Don't have one with a man. Group lunches for everyone. Make it explicit. Make it thoughtful. Make it equal. This sounds gay. Make it thoughtful. Make it equal. No. I mean, I'm a guy. I don't do women do that stuff. Have your little tea party and do your little thing, and, and you do your little thing like that. But, it's good. but no. Like, we don't do that. Pretty. Yeah. <laughs> He's a hard man. (laughs) Men need to step up. She said, men need to step up. Oh, now you want him to act like a man. You need to step up. We need to redefine what it means to be a good guy at work. It's not enough to not harass. Now, I think too many people think that's sufficient. That's necessary. That's a basic. But it's not sufficient. So she, what she's saying is we, we as women want to rule over you. And we want to tell you what you're going to do. And we want to set the acceptable terms of everything. This one man, he was afraid. He said, I don't think I've done anything wrong, said Nick Matthews, 42, works at PwC, formerly Pricewater, Waterhouse Coopers, and lives in San Francisco. But has anything, but has anything I've done been interpreted another way? In response, some men are forming all-male text groups at companies or in their industries to brainstorm on harassment issues. Some said they plan to be a lot more careful in interacting with women because they felt that the line between friendliness and and sexual harassment was way too easy to cross. Well, duh, when you're hanging out with women all the time, going out to dinner with them, joking around with them, and hanging around them all the time, it's going to be easy those lines get get crossed real easy. That's why they're not supposed to be there in the first place. Because you can't treat them like you're not going to. A man isn't going to be able to treat a woman like that. He's he's not some, um, oh, I don't know the word for it. He can't look he can't look at that woman and see anything else but a woman. That's not how he's made. Yeah, it's naturally how he's made. He looks at a woman and that's a woman. He can't like make that not a woman. Right? That's not how he works. In response, some men are forming those all others are struggling to reconcile how these behaviors could happen even among the men who believe in equal rights. Joe Milton, 30, an entrepreneur in Denver with Baker Technologies, a platform for cannabis dispensaries, said he had recently decided to be more careful about corporate offset off sites after seeing the swell of the Me Too claims. When I hear someone on my team is having a pool party, now I'll say, hey, maybe no managers should be there. I can't imagine having a pool party with a bunch of women and men together. I just can't even fathom that. Like, that's a good idea. Wow, people are dumb. What? Yeah, with a bunch of cannabis. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> they had pot there. I guess it'd be worse. But if someone can't understand that, then maybe, yeah, cannabis and with, uh, yeah, all of it. Yeah. yeah. If someone can't, alcohol, you mix alcohol in there with, with uh, cannabis, alcohol, and everything else. First of all, what guy can go to work, could go to a pool party and see women in bathing suits And that's not going to have an impact on him, on how he works with that woman. Now, me, you know, me seeing Zach in a pair of shirt, uh, shirts and a shorts or whatever, that's not going to do anything for me at all. Right. I mean, that's not going to do anything for a guy. Right. At least it better not anyway. Um, (laughs) But. Seeing a woman in a bikini is going to is going to have an effect. Duh. Yeah, duh. Mr. Siegel, who runs the anti-harassment training, is now expanding part of the program called Safe Mentoring, which teaches men how to mentor younger women without harassing them. (laughs) 
<laughs> at a recent session, a male supervisor talked about having an extra ticket to a sporting event and feeling he could invite only a male colleague. Mr. Siegel went over how to invite a female colleague without sexually harassing her. I mean, I just don't know how you would look at some woman and be like, hey, you want to go out to a, a game with me? Here's a ticket. Like, how do you say that to a woman and that not sound like a date? Right? How does that not sound like you're you're asking her out? How do they expect you not to, for that to be viewed that way? He goes on to say, the answer to harassment cannot be avoiding women. Still, some workers said they were starting to follow the Pence rule, which is formerly known as the Billy Graham rule. Well, that was done before Billy Graham. That's been, you could call it the Joseph rule. <laughs> right? Yeah. Still, some workers said they were starting that uh, after the evangelical preacher, but is now named for Vice President Mike Pence. Mr. Pence said he does not eat alone with women who are not his wife or attend an event without her if alcohol will be served. Pretty wise, actually. A conservative writer, Sean Davis, wrote that a lot of men in media should have effectively been heeding the Pence rule all along. He said he had always followed it and, the, and that coastal liberal America was finally waking up to how useful avoiding private meetings with women could be. That's for sure. He said, you know, he talked about avoiding uh, things. Now more than a year into the Me Too movement with its devastating revelations of harassment and abuse in Hollywood, Silicon Valley, and beyond, Wall Street risks becoming more of a boys club rather than less of one. Why? Because they don't want to get, into, they don't want to get caught up. Women are grasping for ideas on, on how to deal with it because it is affecting our careers, said Karen Alinsky, president of the Financial Women's Association, a senior vice president of Wells Fargo. It's a real loss. Not really. You know, you know how you deal with it? You go home. Go home. What's that? Yeah, exactly. There's a... <laughs> There's a danger, too, for companies that fail to squash the isolating backlash. And don't take steps to have top managers be open about the issue and make it safe for everyone to discuss it. Yeah, like I want to discuss sexual harassment with somebody, uh, said Steven Zweig, an employment attorney with Fort Harrison. If men avoid working or traveling with women alone or stop mentoring women for fear of being accused of sexual harassment, he said, those men are going to back out of a sexual harassment complaint and ride into a sex discrimination complaint. See how it works? See how it feminizes a man? He don't know what to do. He's like, I look, if I hang out with her alone, she can accuse me of this. If I don't, then she's going to say I'm sexist. How do you win with that? You don't. That's the point. It's to feminize men, leave him in a place of indecision so he can't do anything. So he's weaker. So he doesn't rule. So he doesn't lead. That's what it's for. That's what it's designed to do. In this charged environment, the question is how, to how, how the response to Me Too might actually end up hurting women's progress. Given the male dominance in Wall Street top jobs, one of the most pressing consequences for women is the loss of male mentors who can help them climb the ladder. There aren't enough women in senior positions to bring along the next generation all by themselves. Oh, okay. Said Lisa Kaufman, chief executive officer of LaSalle Securities. Advancement typically requires that someone at a senior level knows your work, gives you opportunities, and is willing to champion you within, within the firm. It's hard for a relationship like that to develop if the senior person is unwilling to spend one-on-one -on -one time with a more junior person. Men have to step up, she said, and not fear, and not let fear be a barrier. Well, lady, it's easy for you to say because you don't have one, you're not one accusation away from losing everything you got. Because you can go rape boys in high school and nothing happens to you. They give you a slap on the wrist. You just accuse a guy of doing something there, and it can destroy his whole life. 
That's exactly what it's all about. And it's to feminize them and make them afraid so they won't stand up and be men. When really the real problem is those women should just be home. They shouldn't even be there. They're causing trouble being where they're at. It is trouble because they're not supposed to be there. God never meant them to be there. God never meant them to be in that place. And you put them in that, and they're in that place, and it's rebellion to God, and look what happens because of it. And you have the Me Too movement. Flirting is not consent. No more silence. Being drunk is not consent. Why are they? Here's what, let me give you the bottom line. Most of these women, or many of these women, got drunk with these men, flirted with these men, and these men took advantage of them. That's what happened. And both were wrong. But guess who's the only one that's going to get in trouble for it? The man. Right? They're going to believe the woman right away. So that's why Pence says, I'm not going to be alone with any woman. Because if I'm alone with her, she can lie about me. Right? That's what this Me, me Too. It, 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 that's what this Me Too movement is about: is to take the mas- steal the masculinity of man away. Now, whoever's done wrong and wicked, they need to be dealt with for it. Right? I'm not condoning rape or anything like that. Those people need to. The Bible has an answer for rape: it's to kill them. If they've raped them, then they put them to death. I mean, that's simple. Simple judgment. Right? If it's proven. But this, this interaction and the way that it's been has caused this. How about Dinah? She had a Me Too moment. Genesis 34, 1, And Dinah, the daughter of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her and lay with her and defiled her. And his soul clave unto Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the damsel. And spake kindly unto the damsel. Well, Jacob's pretty upset about this, but what in the world did he let her go for? Why was she out seeing the daughters of the land? Why wasn't she home? Right? Look what happened. So what her brothers do? Got mad because it happened? And went and killed them when they were getting circumcised and went and killed them all. Took all their money and took off. Right? And Jacob judged him for it. Jacob said, with rage, you know, you fury, you did this. But that never would have happened if Dinah would have stayed home. If she wasn't out running around. How did she get close up to this guy? Why was she with him? Why was she alone with him? Why did she, why did she do that? Right? And it doesn't sound like she was very upset about it. The Bible's not recording that it was like the struggle that took place. Right? See, this is what happens when you don't follow the order that God lays down. All of this is a result of forcing women into the workforce. It feminizes men and it changes God's order. So you have men that, that they're around these women all the time. They're bottling up things and not being the natural way God made them. Like you can't have a conversation with a man like you do a woman. I don't even know how you guys deal with it in the workplace, to be honest with you. If if you deal with women like that, I don't even know how you deal with it. I mean, being kind, I I understand that, but the point is that I don't know how you deal with it in dealing with when you get close to work around these people all the time. Because it's not like dealing with a man. And you have to be cognizant of that, but they don't have to be. They can deal with you and with women any way they choose. But you can't. Right, and they do. They do what they want. I mean, I thank God he called me to preach. And that's what he called me to do. The reason I thank God about that is because if they ask me, well, are you sexist? Well, yes, I am. I absolutely am, because God is. God God discriminates. Right? I believe woman's worth 
is of more value than any man could ever gain in any monetary, any gold, any silver in the place that God gave her. But I'll tell you what, when she leaves that place purposely and rebels against God, not because she's forced to, but because she wants to and becomes a raging Jezebel, she ain't worth a whole lot. When men work with men, it's much easier. When men work with women, they have to tap into their feminist side. I don't have one either. That's why I get in trouble a lot. This article from Vice.com. That said, we know there are a myriad of structural and cultural issues that prevent women from rising up the ranks. Look at this. From women being unfairly burdened by domestic work. Do you know what that unfairly burdened domestic work is? She's talking about children and a husband. Do you understand that? Unfairly burdened by domestic work. Is that what they call children today? Burdens instead of blessings? Yeah, that's why they kill them. That's right. Yep. Yeah. Right, exactly. Exactly. From women being unfairly burdened by domestic work to their apparently destructive lack of self-confidence. Well, because they're where they're not supposed to be. To the fact that women simply aren't believed to be as competent as men. Well, they're not. They're not in where they're trying to be. They are very competent in where God placed them. They are very incompetent where they are not to be. Is that, is that a little too straightforward? Well, that, is that going to... Does that offend? It should offend. <laughs> it should offend those that aren't right, those that have a problem with that. You're saying women are incompetent? They are when they try to act like a man, Yes. Just like if a man tries to act like a woman, he's very incompetent. Right? He can't switch and go play Mr. Mom. Right? He, he can't go like, I mean, it doesn't work. It might work for a short time, but it doesn't work long term. Your husband can't be like another mom to your children. Like that doesn't work. He's not made that way. He's not even built that way. He could be there to be a blessing to you, and he could lead his ch- uh, guide his children and teach them and train them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, but he's not going to be like a second mom to them. Like, it doesn't work that way. He doesn't have that, like, female side like that to be that way, nor the patience to be that way. Right? Doesn't have it. Why? Because he's not equipped with it. He'd be very incompetent trying to do that. Women simply aren't believed to be as competent as men, despite all the evidence to the contrary. Well, I would argue with that evidence. Okay, here's what it comes down to here. We need to be able to connect masculinity and femininity. Oh, At least they admit it. So instead of seeing these as opposite constructs, shouldn't we really see the ideal manager as elements of both? So you're saying is what you want is you want a man and a woman to be masculine and feminine at the same time. Right? So we are all just the same, masculine and feminine at the same time. I don't think that's going to work. That's called hybridization. That's that spirit of Baphomet that we talked about. Shepard said, I definitely think it's how men react generally to female superiors because women are very aware of the stereotypes that surround them and of how negative the consequences can be when they violate any of their gender norms. Oh, so there are gender norms? Yeah, there there actually are. Zach, did you know there were gender norms? 
Okay, good. We'd have a different conversation if you said something different. Women try to take a very cooperative and collaborative leadership style. With cookies or... And, that, and actually the research indicates women are more likely to demonstrate... I could say like, Giannis doesn't like cookies, I don't think. So I, I need to think of something else for you. Maybe like, I don't know, Giannis, what do you eat? Like oatmeal and big like... I don't know what that creation you have. That is a collaboration that your wife makes when she has that big... That is a mighty collaboration. That is a mighty, and she does it in the kitchen, that mighty collaboration. It is huge. It's in a bowl this big. That is a collaboration for sure. That, what's that got in it? What'd you say? Yeah. That's a collaboration right there. And actually, the research indicates women are more likely to demonstrate transformational leadership, which is really about connecting with your followers and modeling the type of behavior you want them to engage in. And making sure that your followers have an understanding of the bigger meaning of what you're doing. Translation, you can make them act like women. That's not leadership. No, it isn't. It appears that women fear being viewed as weak. Well, the Bible does say you're the weaker vessel. Fear being viewed as weak for not acting as assertively as their male colleagues. I, I don't like assertive women. I don't like bossy women. I don't like loudmouth women. And I definitely don't like assertive women. Ugh. It appears that women fear that, though. If they don't pursue it... Now, let's see. Let me back up here. For not acting as assertively as their male colleagues, knowing they won't get that... Well, they know it's unnatural to act that assertive. That's not natural. Women's not, they weren't made to act that assertive. To be that way. To be those power brokers and movers and shakers. They weren't made to be that way. Right. The Hillary Clinton plant pantsuit. <laughs> Knowing they won't get that promotion if they don't pursue it while continually running the risk of being branded as power hungry. And becoming a target for unfairly assertive, assertive behavior. Because when, when women get aggressive with men, they, it tends to make men more aggressive. Like, they get like, Ugh. They like roar. That's like naturally for a man, they want to just like roar when a woman like bucks them. That's how they're made. As it stands, in order to reach the dizzying heights of business success, women have to be far smoother operators than men vying, manipulation, than vying for or working in the same positions. Male leaders who have the opportunity to be role models for other men in organizations, they should be doing things like making sure they have a collaborative leadership style, making sure they take time out when they have a child, and make sure they engage in behaviors that are maybe more stereotypically feminine to show that there's nothing wrong with being more nurturing. Yeah, it's like you need to be more nurturing, <laughs> right? But the yeah, men need to start being more feminine, so they need to take <laughs> maternity leaves and everything. But <laughs> now there's nothing wrong with helping out or whatever. But the point is, that it's just it's just odd to me that like you never heard of. Did you hear of fifty years ago paternity leave? I'm sorry, I'm just going to say it. That feminizes men. It said, you got to go be like a woman now, and you got to have paternity leave now. now. I mean, guys may have took vacation time off to be with their wives or whatever, yeah. But the point is that now it's like, oh, well, we got to have equal rights, so we got to have paternity. That sounds so feminine to me. Like men stopped working when they had babies. Well, I'm not going to work anymore. I have a baby. My wife had a baby. I'm going to go home. Yeah, exactly. Who's... Who's, well, who's going to make the money? Right? Who's going to make the money if he's taken off? I guess you get paternity pay, yeah. Uh, I believe you. I, I believe you. I didn't get any. Um... 
Okay, so look what they're saying and making sure they engage. So they're saying leaders need to make sure they engage behaviors that are maybe more stereotypically feminine to show there's nothing wrong with being more nurturing. Translation gay. Then we, <laughs> then, then we will get to a point when it's not about the gender of the supervisor any longer. When it's more accepted that a leader is going to have both masculine and feminine components. If I had the Hoggard music, it would be dun dun da, right? Because that's right. That is the Baphomet spirit right there. We want them to be masculine and feminine. Zach, do you want to be masculine and feminine? Okay. I just check it. Scott, do you want to be masculine and feminine? You must tap it, tap into your feminine side. I don't have one. Lee's gone. Ken Cooper, global head of HR at Bloomberg, a financial software data media giant, considered one of the world's best employers for women, said the business had proactively implemented development and leadership initiatives to address what they knew to be a very common bias. Yeah, because, see, you know why they know there's a bias? Because you're created with that bias. Men are created with that bias. They're made with it. They're, they're made with it. These help our employees understand how unconscious bias affects their interactions. Mine's conscious, though. Mine's not unconscious. I mean, mine's conscious. I, I really have it. Like, I consciously know I have it, and I like it. I like it. I have it. I like it. And I'm not going to turn back from it by the grace of God. <laughs> no. It's not microaggression. It's very big, huge, Donald trump size aggression. Right? It's huge aggression. Like his aggression. Right? We also teach our managers... Oh, listen, it says, and our per perceptions around the different ways men and women lead, he said in an email. We also teach our managers how to lead diverse teams, providing them with the tools to manage and react to a variety of biases, including gender. When we contacted a dozen companies for comment, all of which claimed to instill a pro-woman cult work culture, with most admitting to having knowledge of the problem off the record, only Bloomberg was happy to, yeah, that's the gayest place in the world, was happy to address the issue publicly taking light relief in the assumption that millennials are more likely to hold feminist principles is unfortunately not an option. Well, that's a little bit of hope <laughs> that millennials don't think that way. As Shepard said, there was no evidence of younger men being more likely to treat male and female managers fairly than the generation before them. Well, that's good. So in order to stop women negotiating this uphill struggle alone, businesses need to face up to the fact that their female staff, regardless of their management style, are more likely to be subjected to assertive behavior from their male subordinates. Ugh. That whole male subordinates right there? Ugh. Then men in the same position. This is undoubtedly an issue to be addressed across every industry with female workers if women are to gain and hold more leadership positions. And even as the bonus splitting experiment indicates, to finally gain equal pay for equal work. But it's not equal work. Until then, we are setting up women to fail. Good. What does the Bible say? Psalm 2, 1 through 3. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. What does that mean? Those cords, they want to break the bands and the cords asunder. What is that? Those are the, the, the laws and the ways that God instituted, the fundamentals that God instituted in society. What is the Antichrist? This is a psalm about the Antichrist. And it's a psalm saying that what he wants to do is the kings of the earth set themselves up. They take counsel. They want to break the bands asunder. They want to break all the societal norms. They want to change it all. They want to destroy it all. They want to make it all different. Ecclesiastes 4.12 says, And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. That threefold cord of what? Family, church, government, right? Or God, the same under, under church. 
But that threefold cord, or God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. But that threefold cord is not easily, not quickly broken. They know that. That's why they want to destroy everything. That's why they want to change it. Now we're done for now. This is tune in for next time. <laughs> Competing and not complimenting. There's a difference between the sexes. Competing or complimenting. But we'll save that for next time. All right, now that everybody's mad, we'll go home. <laughs> What's that? Yep. Right, they need sensitivity training because men are not naturally feminine like a woman and sensitive like that. They're not. And by the way, they never will be. There is a, there is a sensitivity to a man that he's to have and he's to be compassionate, but he's not going to be sensitive. Right. He would have to be feminine to be that way. Right. Think about think about it this way. Why do you think why do you think women like to hang around uh homosexuals, sodomites, men? Because they're feminine. Right. Right. They show a feminine side. Right, exactly. They're feminine. Right. Ulterior motive. Right. That they can just hang out with them. They have a feminized man, and that's how they expect every man to be. But what they don't realize is that men aren't like that. So when you see all these naked women in society, they expect it. Well, the feminized men, they don't care. They just stand around there, and they don't care. But real men, they know they can't look at that. They got to get away from it. And it bothers them to see it. Amen. And it should. Because they're men. Amen. All right. Let's pray. Father, Lord, thank you. We pray, Lord, that this would help somebody. It helped me, Lord, and I pray that it help others. And, Lord, we pray. We know these truths are hard to take. They're not easy. We need to be bold and stand for real biblical manhood in a day and age where the masculine man is being destroyed right before our eyes. Pushed down. The sodomites come out of the closet and the masculine man is being shoved into it, trying to be forced into it. And Lord, we pray that you would just protect your people and guide them and direct them. Keep us safe and healthy. Help us to walk with you in spirit and in truth. Bring us back safely. Be with those that are not here and those that are returning. We pray for Carly and we pray for the baby, Ezra. And Lord, we pray for Jacob to give them strength, bless them, take care of them, give them full recovery. Pray for others as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.